Thanks a lot, Nick, for the introduction. And uh, the topic of today's talk is modeling ionospheric electrodynamics. And I would like to acknowledge the contributions from a lot of people, and especially thank Art Richman and Gang Lu and Mara Hagen uh, for their support over the years. I start with an overview of my current research projects, which I can basically put into three categories some focusing on the coupling to the high latitude magnetosphere ionosphere coupling and their effects on the mid low latitudes. Uh, then I have a few which have more um, method component included, and I only show a result uh, from this one where the goal is to improve the mantle conductivity to learn also more about uh, Earth's water content. And then uh, several are uh, focusing on the vertical coupling between the lower, at the up, lower atmosphere and the upper atmosphere. All of them have in common that they have a focus on the ionospheric electrodynamics. So I, just, I want to start with an introduction then about ionospheric electrodynamics, uh, show a few examples about the coupling between the lower atmosphere and the upper atmosphere, and then go more in long-term changes due to the changes of Earth's uh, magnetic field, and then uh, show a few results of a new model. Art and I developed a 3D electrodynamo model and conclude with some future work. Here is just a depiction about effects of the ionospheric electrodynamics. Can we actually measure and how? So on the left, you see a schematic of the Earth. This is the daytime, and these bands here are currents uh, flowing in the day side. It's neutral winds pushing the plasma through the magnetic field and setting up current and electric field. Um, and the main current is flowing at the daytime, uh, daytime at 110 kilometers, getting uh, these uh, vortex here. And then you have some current flowing from one hemisphere to the other along magnetic field lines. At high latitudes, it's different. It's coupled to the magnetosphere. At the ground, we can measure the effects from these currents. Uh, here is the magnetic perturbation uh, in Boulder. And for example, here, this is daytime. You can see there is a southward magnetic perturbation. And if you take your right hand, you can see that this uh, is associated with an overhead westward current in the ionosphere. But we cannot only measure it at the ground. This is a schematic of uh, what we can measure. One effect uh, in, in the ionosphere and thermosphere. And shown here is a meridional cut uh, uh, with here the field lines, these uh, thin lines. And uh, in the middle is the magnetic equator. And associated with these currents during the daytime is an eastward electric field. And this eastward electric field produces an E cross B upward drift. And also during the daytime, the uh, ionization is large, so uh, the production of plasma. And this plasma is then lifted upward into a region of uh, reduced recombination and eventually diffuse down along the field lines and forms these plasma crests here to the north and the south of the magnetic equator. And these can be measured. This is from image FUV uh, at 20 local time now, uh, so uh, early night. And you see these enhanced bands along the magnetic equator here and these uh, peaks this is the signal of the waves in the E region which generate this electric field. So this should only indicate we can measure it in the ionosphere and thermosphere at the ground. But let's go back. What is actually the thermosphere ionosphere? And the purpose of this one, this is number density of the neutrals and the electron density here. I would like to point out that there's a magnitude difference here between neutral density and electron density. So it's a weakly ionized plasma. And there's a lot of ion neutral coupling going on. And the other thing I would like to point out, there's this region here, um, the, which we call E region, between around 90 to 130 kilometers, um, where there is a strong day-night difference here in the electron density. 
uh, since uh, at night the solar radiation ionization is missing, but there's high recombination. Uh, so we get a larger day-night difference here than higher up. Um, why is this important? One thing we need for the electrodynamics is conductivities, and they are determined by the electron and neutral um, densities. Um, we focus mainly on two conductivities perpendicular to the magnetic field. Uh, one is the Patterson here, and the other is the Hall. So Patterson produces a current perpendicular to the magnetic field in the direction of the electric field, and the Hall current produces uh, the Hall conductivity produces a current in perpendicular to the magnetic field and the electric field. Uh, both. Um, depend on the electron density as well as ion and neutral um, collision frequency and gyro frequency. So both electron and neutral density are important to determine conductivities. And this shows the profiles uh, here over altitude 100 to uh, 500 kilometer uh, during daytime of the conductivities. And these two lines are for the hall which peaks around 105, 110 kilometer and has a larger magnitude than the Patterson conductivity, which peaks a little bit higher up at around 125 uh, kilometer during the daytime. And there's a larger solar cycle dependence for the Hall than for, uh, for the Patterson term than for the Hall term here. What is important for the electrodynamics is the field line integrated uh, conductivities. So um, we need to integrate the conductivities along the field line, and this leads to conductances, shown here, the diurnal variation. Um, one thing I would like to point out, uh, it's uh, reduced during the nighttime since the solar uh, radiation is missing, and then uh, enhanced during the daytime. And the other thing I would like to point out here, the top solid curve is from the Patterson uh, conductance, which is larger than the Hall term, even though the Hall conductivity uh, magnitude is larger, has a larger peak than the Patterson. And that's due to the geometry of the field line, which can have a longer integration path uh, in in the region of large Patterson uh, conductivity than Hall. So what are the currents in, in the ionosphere? And for everything I uh, show here, um, we assume that the electric field is static. We can express it by an electric potential, as well as the uh, current is divergence-free. Um, here are uh, the current sources uh, we are considering. There's the wind dynamo. Uh, um, so it's this uh, neutral wind which is pushing the plasma through the magnetic field, generating uh, this current. And this is for 16 local time from the model over altitude here. And this is the E region showing that this uh, wind-driven um, current is really large. But an electric field needs to be set up to make the current divergence free. And so what you get is this uh, dotted line here. In addition to this uh, wind dynamo, dynamo driven current, you have some F region uh, current. They are smaller, but uh, like plasma pressure gradient driven current and gravity driven current. But compared to this one, they do not depend on conductivities. So they can also be. Um, large when the conductivities are low, for example, at night. The plasma pressure uh, gradient-driven current, um, so it is um, basically scales with uh, the gradient in the electron density. So it's uh, westward above the electron density peak and eastward below. It tends to close within the F region. So there's only a very small additional electric field uh, set up to make it divergence free. That is different, different uh, for the gravity driven current here. So uh, this um, is basically eastward since gravity is down and the magnetic field is northward. Um, 
And this has to close somewhere, and during the nighttime, the conductivities are low. So it's closing uh, through the uh, day side E region, as you can see here. So there is this return current here uh, from this eastward current. So electric fields need to be set up, and that's uh, basically the ionospheric electrodynamic, what it's doing, um, which I briefly show here. Um, so it's electrostatic, the current is divergence-free. We combine this uh, with Ohm's law. Uh, so basically, the electric field-driven current, the divergence of this one, is balanced by the source term, so the wind dynamo-driven current and plasma pressure gradient and gravity-driven current. There is a conductivity we haven't really talked about, which is the parallel conductivity to the magnetic field line. And this is several orders of magnitude larger than these perpendicular conductivities. So when we have a field line, we can assume that it's equipotential. So if we know the potential in one hemisphere, we know it along the field line and in the other hemisphere. And what we can do is uh, then we integrate the perpendicular current along this field line and know that it has to vanish. Um, if we don't integrate really from one hemisphere to the other, we introduce appropriate boundary condition like at mid-latitude. Uh, the current which goes out in one hemisphere on the field line has to go into the other hemisphere if the field line is closed. So doing this reduce this 3D equation to 2D as well as we can solve it now in, in one hemisphere. Um, so we've seen that the one, one complication, and um, I think this was kind of a headache for Wacom and Wacom X, is the grid we are using. It's, it's the magnetic grid, and what is shown here is for year 2015, um, the latitudes of constant apex height. So apex height is basically the highest uh, point of a field line, and you can see it's uh, not orthogonal. It's uh, distorted, and you can see the geographic grid uh, in the background. So uh, you have to use this uh, coordinate system when you solve the ionospheric electrodynamic equation to um, organize it nicely. The wind um, is producing the strong um, current in the E region, which we have seen, uh, which dominate during the daytime. and the wind is also highly variable. And what I talk about um, here is only about global scale waves. So tides, um, they are generated in the lower atmosphere um, due to the absorption of solar radiation by water vapor and ozone and also by latent heat release in the tropics. And they have periods um, of 12 uh, 24 hours and so on, so they are harmonics of a day due to the due to the sun. And I will also talk a little bit about planetary waves. So these are also global uh, oscillation with longer periods, like 22 to 20 days. Um, there can be tight tight interaction, planetary wave tight interaction, and so on. Um, so it's uh, very variable what comes up from the lower atmosphere. So putting this all together, this very brief uh, overview here, um, so we have tides and waves propagating up from the lower atmosphere, uh, shown here. This is at a particular local time uh, from a model. Uh, you see these peaks here. This gives you a dynamo force, uh, which then uh, generates currents and electric fields. Uh, this shows the E-cross speed drift, uh, which at low latitudes can uh, move the plasma around. Um, here, for example, at local noon, you can see these enhancements, which are generated by the neutral wind in the E region. And then uh, you get these plasma distributions uh, here, which have a signature of the wind uh, in the E region that can feed back to the neutral wind and could, to the conductivities. So let's focus first on the coupling between the wind and the electric field and the lower and the upper atmosphere. 
Um, one thing we did uh, here is including a self-consistent uh, electrodynamo in Wacom X. And this is a figure from Hang Li Lu's paper about Wacom X. And shown here is the vertical drift at Hikamaka. That's an equatorial uh, station, so it's at a magnetic equator. Uh, and it's for equinox condition. So during the daytime, you see an upward drift. At night, it's downward. And the dotted line here uh, indicates the climatology. So what you get on average. And the uh, gray lines show what Wacom now, considering the wind, it, it generates self-consistently and the conductivities, what drift you get now. So um, now you have a self-consistent electrodynamo. You push the plasma around and get I-neutral coupling with considering really the wind and the conductivities in the model. There's a really strong coupling going on between the lower and the upper atmosphere uh, during sudden stratospheric warming. So it's a very disturbed lower at atmosphere. And um, a sudden stratospheric warming is, happens when there's strong planetary wave activity um, and in the winter hemisphere, the polar vortex basically shifts off the geographic pole. And what you can get, once it's shifting off, you get one maxima, one minima. And this is indicated here. This is a wave one around 30 kilometer in the northern hemisphere. This shows the climatology. <coughs> this for uh, 2013. And suddenly you have this enhanced uh, wave one here. When it splits into two, you get two maxima, two minima, and then you see here there is a strong wave two. And associated with these uh, strong waves, the zonal mean wind can reverse, uh, as, as shown here, as well as the temperature in the stratosphere is increasing. There's a decrease above, and then the stratopause is elevated. So, the middle atmosphere is very disturbed, and you have these tides and waves propagating through, and the propagation condition change. So what you see in general in the ionosphere, in the vertical drift, is shown here. Uh, this is from Goncharenko. Um, the vertical drift at Hikamaka, this is this uh, equatorial uh, station. And during this enhanced period, so the red line shows uh, the zonal mean wind here, where you have uh, the strong stratospheric warming. You see an enhancement in the drift. This is daytime vertical drift. But before you have this period of really low vertical drift and also afterwards, um, here is the diurnal variation of the daytime drift. Uh, so during this enhanced period, uh, this is the climatology, how on average it looks like. And then you have this period, very high drift. But then a few days before, you basically have no upward uh, drift. So this is very unusual. I worked with um, Bella Fea and Jeff Forbes and Valerie Udin to look at this uh, period. And uh, what is known is that the semi-diurnal migrating tides are strong. That's the solar tide. So it's basically a tide which um, goes with the apparent motion of the sun, has two maxima, two minima in longitude and a period of 12. But it was also shown that the lunar semi diurnal tide is uh, strong. And I had a simulation without lunar tidal forcing. Um, and when I compared with the observation here, it produced an upward drift, so it didn't really reproduce the observation. And Jeff Hobbs provided uh, lunar perturbation at the lower boundary. And when I included this, uh, we didn't really get this upward drift. And this is also shown on this side. Um, over a day of the year, the vertical drift at Hikamaka, at this uh, station, showing that there's this enhanced period and then these uh, low vertical drift periods. And when we include lunar tidal forcing at the lower boundary at 32 kilometers of this model, we also get these reduced uh, drift periods here and an increase here, 
why we don't see this without the lunar tide. So now we can look in the model what is causing this. Uh, and on the left, you can see at the top the solar migrating semi-diurnal tide uh, over day of the year and latitude. So it's enhanced during the period here. There's the stratospheric warming. And this is the lunar component. So this is a gravitational tide which gets enhanced during this period. And the amplitudes are comparable. And we know that for the vertical drift, the zonal wind in the E region is important. Uh, and we also knew that these tides are very strong. Uh, so we bandpassed filtered the zonal uh, wind at 120 kilometers in this uh, 40 degrees south uh, region. And this is uh, the wind we get. So we see there is these low periods and these increased periods. So there's probably a beating going on between these uh, two waves, which then uh, produce a low um, wind here and then uh, generate these low drift periods. This was from uh, the simulation side. I'm also uh, fortunate to be part of the Ionospheric uh, Connection Explorer mission, uh, which is focusing on this vertical coupling question. And on this side, you see a gold view with uh, ICON passes on top of it. Gold was launched in January. ICON is still waiting. Um, and what I would like to focus on here is just the uh, modeling component, uh, which I'm part of. So, and the main things we will measure for, for the modeling. So, here is the satellite, it measures in situ drift, and then it ha forward and backward looking, it measures uh, the volume and the wind in that volume and can therefore derive the wind vector uh, in the uh, important for us, the 90 to 105 kilometer uh, range, as well as the temperature. So for the modeling, we take uh, these values in, in the E region, um, and we need to collect uh, more days to get all the local times and um, longitudes to, to derive global tides. Uh, and this effort is led by Jeff Forbes. Uh, he's using the half mode extensions to provide uh, the tidal specification, which we put into the TIE GCM, that's the thermosphere, ionosphere, electrodynamic general circulation model, which has a lower boundary at 97 kilometers. And then at high latitudes, Jeff Crawley provides um, AMI input. Um, and this is ion convection patterns based on superdon and ground-based magnetometer data, as well as particle precipitation uh, pattern. And then we will run the TIE GCM. There's an additional component here uh, led by Joe Huber. Um, he will use basically the neutral atmosphere from the TIE GCM, so the composition and the wind. Uh, to drive uh, the plasmosphere model, ionosphere plasmosphere. So far, I can, um, it's not launched, but we can already use the model uh, to do uh, some simulation and to evaluate what we will see. And in this study, we modified the lower boundary of the TIE GCM to put in temporal variations um, of perturbations. Uh, that gave us an opportunity for example, to use time GCM output, which has a lower boundary at 32 kilometer and can be forced with reanalysis data, which includes uh, planetary waves and tides. And here we wanted to see um, what, what do we lose by using this long processing window to get the tidal specifications. So shown here is the vertical drift. Uh, over local time, upward during the day, downward uh, at night. And we used here uh, time GCM uh, results at 97 kilometers, and they varied from day to day. And you can see there's a lot of variability going on. This is for 2009. And then we did a 27-day average of these uh, 
um, diurnal variations and uh, did a comparison. So this mimics uh, this long processing window we need uh, to get the tides out from the icon uh, observation. And you can see the peaks disappear and the drift is a little bit lower. So simulations can help us understand uh, later with the interpretation of the results. In another study, we used this uh, and the uh, TIE sim icon to look at solely symmetric planetary waves. So they don't vary in longitudes. Uh, they have periods between 2 to 20 days, uh, but are uh, solely symmetric. And this uh, shows in SABA data and temperature this solely symmetric uh, planetary wave here in the E region. This is an 11 day period. This is a five day uh, period. And it's also known that the tides, they're modulated by the planetary waves. Um, so on this side, uh, over uh, this is latitude. Uh, and for October, from time GCM at 100 uh, kilometer, uh, you see the semi-diurnal migrating component and it has these peaks every few days. So this is a signal of the planetary waves. Uh, this is the diurnal migrating tides. So uh, together with Jeff Forbes and Zhao Li Chan and Maura Hagen, uh, we looked at if maybe the dissipation of these tides can produce these uh, sonally symmetric uh, planetary wave signals. So we took the time GCM results at 97 kilometer and then filtered it for the sonally symmetric part and for the tides and the two simulations. Um, what is shown here is the daily mean um, that basically removes uh, the tides. Uh, at 120 kilometer at the equator um, from our um, uh, simulations. The first one is only using um, solely symmetric perturbations at the lower boundary, so no tides. This includes tides, so you can <coughs> see there's more variability here. And this is over longitudes to uh, kind of indicate what zonal wave numbers are in there, and this is for October to see the periods. And then this is only the difference between the two simulations to isolate uh, the effect of the tide. Uh, so these two look very similar, indicating that the tide uh, is very important. And at the bottom, you see the spectra of uh, each of them, so over wave period and zonal uh, wave number. So there is a zonally zon symmetric uh, planetary wave in here, but it's very weak. And the main part comes from the tide, so indicating that the tide actually um, at least contributes to the zonally symmetric planetary wave in the E region. So this was all like waves, hours, days, and now let's go to longer, like decadal uh, changes. Um, and together with Gang, Lu, and Art Richmond, uh, we want to know what are the effects of the change in the geomagnetic main field on the ionosphere thermosphere, especially during storm time? I mean, using a realistic um, magnetic field prediction. And we know that the North Pole is moving, uh, so the magnetic North Pole is moving northward and also westward. And so we, we looked around. We took a forecast of Earth's magnetic field uh, from Julien Bert uh, that's based on an inverse geodynamo with data assimilation. And this shows the magnetic field strengths here um, over the geographic uh, grid. For 2003, this is where we did run a strong. Uh, 2067, we picked that because 50 years um, in, in the future, the model uh, still reproduced a reasonable result. And you can see this South Atlantic anomaly here is getting uh, deeper, moves westward, and is getting wider. This is the difference uh, here between the two field strengths. And another thing I would like to point out that in the southern hemisphere, the magnetic field is decreasing more strongly than in the northern hemisphere. So 
this is uh, what the, this model predicts. And then Gang provided AMI input, so ion convection and particle precipitation pattern for the Halloween storm here. Um, this is uh, IMFBC, uh, so there are these southward periods here during the storm, and then a few northward. And we looked at Joule heating as a measure of the energy input uh, into the ionosphere thermosphere, so uh, integrated over the polar region and height integrated, which is shown here for the northern hemisphere, and this is for the southern hemisphere. And the two colors indicate uh, the uh, different geomagnetic main fields. Everything else is, is the same. Um, the scale here is uh, kind of uh, large, so when you look at the percentage change, you can see in the southern hemisphere uh, there is an increase of the joule heating uh, up to 20%, and in the northern hemisphere, especially during the storm, it's between minus 5 to 8% change. And that is caused uh, only by the change in the geomagnetic main field which is uh, strongly decreasing in the southern hemisphere, but less so in the northern hemisphere. Overall, the energy input is increasing, so what we would expect is more heating, atmosphere is expanding, uh, neutral density at a particular height is increasing. If we put in different energies in the two hemispheres, we probably also change the global circulation as well as the composition. So we looked at... Um, <coughs> The neutral density change, uh, this shows from CHAMP over latitude and day of the year at uh, around 13 local time. And on this side is from the simulation um, for 2008, 2067, the neutral density change at CHAMP altitude around 390 kilometers. And here shows the difference between the two uh, simulations. So even before the storm, uh, there's at least a 1% increase in the neutral density at a particular height, only due to the change in the geomagnetic main field. And then uh, during the storm at low latitudes, it's around 3%, and then at high latitude, uh, up to 10%, and similar in the two hemispheres. Um, we also looked in... Yeah? I, I just want to understand the experiment. It's using the same forcing from Amy yeah. with a different main field yeah. uh, forecast into the future. But uh, couldn't, if the main field changes and therefore also the magnetospheric configuration, yeah. couldn't the forcing also change? So Ingrid, uh, Ingrid Knossen looked into this. She used, I mean, she experimented with a change in the dipole moment and um, when, when she did these experiments, and I used this change of, I mean, there's only 3.4% change in dipole moment. Um, this kind of, according to her figures, uh, is like a 0 0.05 kilovolt difference in, in the cross-polar cap potential drop. So I'm not considering this, and I, it's probably not important um, here, since it's, it's very small. Um, compared to what what the absolute potential drop is at high latitude. Yeah, it's a good question. So this is neglect, neglected. Uh, so what we also wanted to know is um, how uh, geomagnetic indices are affected. And this focuses on the AE index, which is a measure of um, the horizontal current in, in at high latitudes. Uh, it's Hall current, and it's especially strong uh, during storm times. And it's based on the magnetic perturbation measured at, at these uh, stations here. If the uh, geomagnetic field is changing and the station is fixed with respect to the geographic uh, location, um, for example, here we, we focused on Post de la Belen in, in Canada, and the magnetic pole is moving northward, the station is fixed, means that the station suddenly is more equatorward uh, with respect to the magnetic pole. Um, so the, this 
uh, shows here the northward ground magnetic perturbation at the station and blue is for 2003 and uh, red is for 2067 and it indicates that the station is further away from this uh, electrode jet and therefore the uh, signal is lower. But when we look at all, uh, basically calculate the A index for 2003 and 2067 and the difference is shown here. So there are periods when it's getting larger but uh, also uh, periods when it's getting uh, uh, smaller in 2067. So uh, this indicates uh, maybe we should look uh, more closer into this. And the other point I want to make here, we can calculate the magnetic perturbation um, at the ground. And what we do for that is um, <coughs> we consider a current sheet. All the current is flowing above us. Um, but what we also wanted to know is uh, what is the magnetic perturbation uh, at satellite height, so to compare with satellite data. And for that, we need to know where the current is actually flowing. And so we uh, developed a new model here of the electrodynamics, uh, which gives us the uh, 3D um, ionospheric current. And this looks strange. <laughs> the colors are changed here. Um, so the key point here is with this new electrodynamo, we have a consistent formulation uh, for the electric field and the current. Uh, this is something we don't have with the existing electrodynamo in the TIE GCM, for example. We have approximation which are valid to calculate the electric field, but we cannot go back and derive realistic three-dimensional uh, current anymore. And with this one, we satisfy that the current is divergence-free at each element uh, here. Otherwise, uh, same assumptions as before. So now we can compare with uh, satellite observation. And shown on the left here is from CHAMP, radial current over magnetic local time and magnetic latitude. And I want to focus here on the equator. And JAMP uh, has three satellites, and this is derived from the two lower ones, which were flying next to each other in the beginning of the mission, me measuring the magnetic uh, field, and <coughs> therefore could derive the current between the satellite. So during the daytime, there's a downward current um, that's associated with a westward wind uh, in the F region. And uh, in the evening, there's an upward current uh, due to the eastward uh, wind in the F region. And now with the model here, uh, we can uh, get this upward current uh, in the evening and a downward current uh, during the day so we can look at the current flow. This swarm um, itself was designed to um, basically calculate or uh, specify the lithospheric magnetic field and the core field and so on. And what is shown here is what a satellite like a swarm, for example, measures at 400 kilometer. And this is based on an empirical model uh, from Terry Sabaka. It's for 2002, it's a quiet uh, period, but it should indicate all the contributions a satellite measures. and. If you're interested only in the lithosphere, which is like uh, 10 to 100 nanotesla, you want to remove these contributions. And there are some from the magnetosphere, uh, from the ionosphere. They are highly varying spatially and temporally. Um, then you have one from the lithosphere, which, for example, uh, you might be interested in. And then the huge core field here from the outer core. So with this new dynamo, we could provide uh, some guidance about um, how large are these fields at satellite height, uh, since we can have we have the three D current, and what people interested in in these fields in the lithosphere or the main field, um, what they do is they use only nighttime measurements, uh, since we've seen during the daytime 
the wind dynamo is, uh, or the wind dynamo driven current is so large um, and difficult to remove since it's so variable, so they focus on nighttime. That's true. Yep. So I was wondering, the, the, for the little sphere, the magnitude is comparable to the ionosphere field. <coughs> I was wondering the, the, the time scale of the variation oh. of this little sphere. How, how this is static. Yeah, so that, yeah. Never change it. Uh, maybe on very long time scales, yeah. I mean, this is changing decadal scales, and this, I think it's pretty much fixed. Uh, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, yeah. And I mean, these are low values, I think, here. This is for, for that model. The electric jet can be much larger, and then if you have a storm or so. What, what's uh, the distinction between magnetospheric and ionospheric? <coughs> Okay. I, think, I think what they do, they might use uh, the harmonics, they express everything in spherical harmonics, and like how they dis distinguish between this field and this is at a certain order they cut off and say, okay, this is the core and this is the other. And they probably do, might do the same thing for the external fields. Uh, they say, okay, everything which is more large scale higher or uh, lower order, um, yeah, is magnetosphere and the other is. But I'm not 100% sure, or it might be indices. Well, I mean, this, clearly, this is very... clearly a latitude distinction, which is yeah, similar uh, to the one we would make. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, uh, I think, DST going in uh, here and, um, yeah, so... The magnetosphere field is mainly DST. Yeah. <laughs> they have a cosine and that, that's that's equatorial, right? So. Yeah, that, this is the band you see here, and then uh, high latitude. Whenever you see the plots, they have real difficulties to quantify. Uh, I mean, that's where they have the most noise in fitting. So, yeah. Anyway, so. Um, we have this new model now, and this is for 20 local times, so night time. Uh, and at the top, you see the eastward current density. Um, and this is the wind-driven current plus uh, the current due to the induced electric field. So it's small. Uh, this is the magnetic perturbation associated with this current. And uh, it's the scalar one. This means it's in the direction of the main field just to give an idea of the magnitude. Um, so uh, this contribution is small if you're a satellite up here, but they know there is uh, F region current here, the plasma pressure driven current. Um, so it's westward above, uh, basically the electron density peak and eastward below. And this generates a magnetic signal here of uh, several nanotesla. Um, they're aware of this, there was a, um, kind of approximation suggested, which takes into account the local plasma pressure to remove this contribution. Um, we also know that there's gravity-driven current here. Uh, so this is eastward. And then even at 20 local time, uh, there's a return current here in the E region. And the main signal you see here is due to this uh, return current. It's a very focused, uh, strong current. Uh, and this is positive. So uh, if you correct uh, satellite data for only this part without considering that part, actually, you, you're probably worse off than not correcting at all. Um, and by doing uh, studies like this, we can provide some guidance when uh, satellite data should be corrected and when not. The last example here I would like to show is where we worked with Gary Eckbert, and he's an expert on mantle conductivity, and Patrick Elkin, uh, who's doing a lot of uh, satellite data processing uh, from SWARM and JAMP. And the goal here is uh, to use the ionosphere <coughs> current uh, system as a source, and then um, invert it together with um, the mantle conductivity uh, to define it. So we use, um, so we have a signal in the ionosphere and we have data we can fit and therefore we can uh, get the mental conductivities. Um, 
We, have, we are at step one, where we want to define the ionospheric current in a better way. And so what we used is a year of TIE GCM simulation, the magnetic perturbation. We simplified it uh, to get the main patterns out of this uh, using principal component analysis. And here shows uh, two of the spatial modes. Uh, what is shown is equivalent current functions. So. Um, it's basically the current uh, which produces the same ground magnetic perturbation as the true 3D current system. And then we fit these patterns uh, to the data. Uh, we use for each uh, UT, we use different UTs uh, since this is done on the geographic grid. And we use 10 modes which explain around 97% of uh, the variations here. And then when we fit it to swarm data, um, this is one uh, comparison with uh, swarm A. Uh, it's the red is swarm A, and the green is uh, from the principal component analysis. So we get a steep gradient here, um, and pretty well even uh, like in, in this region. There's another method, the 2D spherical elementary current system, and um, it has some issues in this case of getting the steep gradient. So we need to refine this method to better specify the ionospheric current system to be able to invert it for the mental conductivities. So in, in the future, and uh, what we have started working on, um, together with Gang and Art and Yue Deng from, and her Murray team is to use a field line current uh, in, in the models as forcing. And the first thing we did is uh, test the sensitivity of the Joule heating um, to any mis potential misalignment between particle precipitation and ion convection or field line current. Um, so this gives us some idea how uh, the system, uh, the sensitivity of the system, um, since the boundary condition is different. One time you, the boundary condition is a fixed field current, and the other time it's fixed electric field. Um, and this has an effect on, on the Joule heating. We want to consider the differences in the field line current in the two hemispheres. Uh, so we are working on this. Uh, shown here is uh, ampere data, so it's not always uh, symmetric, even considering dipole tilt and IMFBY conditions. And here is a preliminary result uh, of the method uh, we are testing. Um, <laughs> this is the potential drop in the northern hemisphere, this is in the southern hemisphere, and we compare to Amy and uh, Weimar uh, in, in this case. We still need to look into uh, the Joule heating, uh, which so far is low when we uh, force the system with field line current from <coughs> ampere. And the goal is to look at mid and low latitudes effects due to these interhemispheric differences. Once ICON is up, um, we want to look into the coupling. And at the moment, uh, I'm working with Rod Healers and Jeff Forbes and other ICON uh, people uh, to use the model and study how much uh, we can learn from the local uh, drift measurements, I mean, in, in the model, and the wind measurements along a field line. Um, and then I continue with this uh, ionospheric variability due to planetary waves, uh, as well as uh, getting a better specification of the ionospheric current to infer the mental conductivity. And that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Are there questions, Bill? Uh, yeah, you're one of those last slides, future work slide. Uh, you were talking about the misalignment there. Mm -hmm. um, so I gather from that, you, in, in what you're doing, you're, you don't solve if you assume a current and you have a distribution of conductivity and the electric field comes out mm -hmm. from a solution, what's mm -hmm. that what, is that what's being done here? Or yeah. What's so, the origin of misalignment? Then? Oh, I mean, we wanted to see if, I mean, in, in general, in, in for example, TIE-GCM, you have one model 
for, for the ion convection one model for the particle precipitation. They might use different indices and they might not align. Um, wh when you use ion convection, your electric field is fixed. Um, so it's, it's sensitive. I mean, it, it scales. Uh, when you use field line current, the electric field is adjusted. Your conductivity is larger or lower, the electric field adjusts, so you see less effect on the joule heating then. Uh, so it's compensating. So in, in this, uh, we basically did a numerical experiment where we had the same electric potential uh, either using with field line current or with uh, the ion convection itself. And then we slightly modified, uh, like offset uh, the aurora basically and um, quantified what is the effect on the joule heating. I mean, on, only to know how sensitive the system is once we feed in ampere data and, I mean, then it, it, you can't control it anymore, I think. I mean... It's going to be whatever it, yeah, the and solution says it should be. At the moment, yeah, we get very low uh, joule heating out, even though, I mean, the potential drop doesn't look too bad, yeah. but the joule heating is really low, so I think we need to go back, look, I mean, maybe the conductances, we, uh, we have to do something there, so. I, I think this is what the magnetosphere people call the conductance problem. Like, I mean, if you, if you knew the potential, you would know the conductance. If you measure the field line current, yeah. if you knew the conductance, you could calculate the potential. And then if you knew the potential, you could calculate the conductance, but, but you don't really know either of those things yeah. unless you have some model or some other measurement that tells you about precipitation, but now you're mixing stuff from two different instruments or yeah. two different models. So what's, what's, the, uh, what's, the, what's the right way to do this? What's the, what are we going to do? <laughs> what's the, what? I'm not sure. I mean, <laughs> but we need, to, we need to try it. It can't be that there's ampere data out there and we don't use it. Well, but I the think. ampere people, Brian told me that they now have a machine that produces uh, potential mm -hmm. along with their field line currents. Somehow, they need and some conductance so as well. They're doing or something. Super or something. Some uh, independent measurement. I, I, I think it's. We'll have to ask, but I think it's derived from their own measurement using some principles of self-consistency yeah, and self conductivity. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Well, exactly. yeah. 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 See, at one point you, you need had it. a magnetospheric model that told you all those things self-consistently, right? Then it it it's gives you everything down. you need to know. Yeah. 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 Well, what's the ground truth here? How well do we really know what the joule heating rate is, the distribution of joule heating? I mean, that's, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> we hear these comments, I mean, you said it, and I'm, and I'm not, yeah. this is not a criticism because everybody says it, but it's like the joule heating rate is too low or too high. But how do we know? What, do Compared we know? to what we yeah. use in general, like Weimar, I mean, yeah. people are using Weimar, people are using Amy, and then suddenly put something else in. And it's low, and I mean, probably, I mean, with these, if it's really low, you could look at observation and, and see that it's not realistic. I mean, up to a certain point, I think you can test if it's too low or not. Um, but it's true, I mean, <laughs> once you reach a certain level of agreement, who knows what is true. But we are used to this now, I mean, so, yeah. yeah. Let's try to get there and understand. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Hangli. So if just from this figure, it seems that the main asymmetry there you see from Ampere, uh, the north-south, mm -hmm. and the south is, yeah. seems to be much larger than the north. Oh, is yeah. that a measurement problem? Or I mean, in this case, shall we trust the, the Amy, the green curve more, uh, or, or what's uh, the problem? Uh, what's, why is there such a big asymmetry just in Ampere? So, I mean, this is the potential drop. So uh, you feed in the field line current and you assume some uh, conductance distribution and this is what comes out. So it might be that there's some inconsistency. Um, 
I mean, in general, I would say Amy is uses a lot of data sources and is doing fitting, and it's calculating the potential drop. I mean, it's one of the things which come out of Amy. Um, so I, I, I mean, personally, I would trust Amy. Um, although in the southern hemisphere, there's not that much observation. Um, so it's probably very reliable in the north. And then you have to look at how much data went in there and, and so on. I mean, that's. So if you have fewer observations, you can get much better agreement. Is what this, this, <laughs> I mean, this plot is saying. it might look more like Weimar than or whatever the background model is. Right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you have to be careful. Amy is not Amy uh, when uh, people present results. I think you have to ask what goes into Amy. Um, is it only Superdown or is it uh, DMSP data and, and so on? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. <laughs>